Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries, in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And what happens when you don't have light? Well, then you have darkness. You can have physical darkness and spiritual darkness. Oh boy, today is October 9th, 2024. I'm in rainy, cloudy South Florida, where we got this Hurricane Milton bearing down on us. Uh, we should be missing the worst part of the storm, but uh, I would appreciate any prayers for protection. Um, I've done just about all the everything I could possibly do to protect the property. Um, so, yeah, would appreciate it. Also, uh, if you'd pray for Charles and Susan, they're in the Fort Myers kind of area. They're going to get the brunt of the storm worse than I am. And, uh, yeah. Uh, with that in mind, let's read something. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 19. Behold, a whirlwind. What is it, a hurricane or a cyclone or a tornado? It's a whirlwind. Uh, what do they call them in the Pacific? I forget. What, uh, oh, a typhoon. Yeah. Well, I don't live in the Pacific, so... Yeah, I don't even know what they're called, but yeah. Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury. Even a grievous whirlwind, it shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. And America is wicked. Jeremiah 30, 23, Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind. It shall fall with pain upon the head of the wicked. All right. This Bible study is going to be on, well, armies of the Lord, wars of the Lord, and his armies. Do you know the army has an arm? Uh, the Lord has an army on earth, and an army in heaven. Oh yeah. Well, the church was supposed to be an army on earth, but we've since been disarmed. We have traded our sword of the Lord, the King James Bible, for an NIV, a butter knife. I don't even know if it's a butter knife. I think it's more like a spoon feeding you garbage. But, um, yeah. The Word of God is called Sword of the Lord, believe it or not. And uh, we're going to go into that. Now, if you believe in universalism, that is, God died for each and every person, well, that's up to you. But uh, the Bible plainly teaches that the Lord has enemies. So, I don't know what to tell you. And it's in the Old and the New Testament. So, you know, you can't say, well, you know, every, everything in the Old Testament was done away with when Jesus came on the cross. And now God loves everybody. Uh, I don't think so. But... Hey, that's just one person's opinion. So, all right, let's take a look at something. Have you ever heard the um, uh, Jesus loves his little children of the world? Uh, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are all precious in his sight. Are they really? Does God have enemies or are is everybody friends or a potential friend now um, 
Oh, and another thing, too. I might have quit my job today. Yeah. Oh, boy. Which is really sad. I really liked... I like my boss, and I like some of the co-workers. Of course, there were some co-workers I could do without, but... Yeah. But, uh... Long story. But, uh... Whatever, you know, I'll get another if I need it. All right. Uh, with that in mind, let's read the book of Exodus, chapter 15 and verse 3. Now, please understand, this is not, I don't do exhaustive studies. I give you, I try to lay out a skeleton, fill it up with mass, and then give you, and not a Catholic Mass, but try to give you enough information that you can do more in-depth research if you wish. And of course I give you chapters and verse numbers. And if you want, you can read the entire chapter before and after and the entire chapter of the verse that I give you to see that I'm not trying to pull verses out of context. So let's look at Exodus 15, chapter 3. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. And I don't want to get into the sacred name stuff. You know, uh, there's a lot of debate over God's proper name. But there, um, I just wonder if well, let's take a look at something real quick. In 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 14, Paul recounts how, how that he was caught up into paradise, into heaven, part of heaven, and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Um, in our sinful flesh, is it, can we even utter God's name and not be burned? I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. I, I'm not saying it's true or I'm not denying it. I don't know. But um, Moses, who was God's friend and talked to him face to face, read the book of Exodus, by the way, um, and Genesis, um, Moses asked to see God face to face, and God said, you can't see my face and live, because we are sinful flesh, which is the whole reason why Christ came to earth, to redeem us from this sinful flesh. God doesn't care about your body. He cares about your soul and your spirit. And when we die, you go somewhere. And I'd rather be with Jesus than the other guy, but... You know, that's just my opinion. So, is God's name one of those unspeakable words which we can't utter? I don't know. But Moses wanted to see God face to face, and I'm paraphrasing. Well, let me not paraphrase. All right, let's go to Moses uh, speaking to the Lord in Exodus chapter 33, verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Now all these people spouting Yeshua, I think it's Joshua. Or Yahshua. You know, I don't know. I'm not an expert on ancient Hebrew, and neither are they. Verse 12. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, Show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he, God, said, 
My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, I think this is Moses, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. I and thy people, God's people, I and thy God, you know, these are God's people. I and thy people. Moses is talking to God. I and thy people. And all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Oh, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Israel, God's people, were to be separated from all the other people of the earth. And if you think I'm talking about an antichrist nation over in the Middle East, you're missing the point. Read Galatians 3.29 50 times or more until you get it. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We don't become heirs. We are the heirs of the promise. Read Galatians 3.29 until you get it. You know, we don't become Abraham's seed because we believe. We believe because we are Abraham's seed. And we are to be separated from the people of of the lands, everybody else. These flood of all these heathen nations upon our Western European and American na nations are a curse from God. So, verse 17. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he, Moses, said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he, God, and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face. Moses, you cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Wow. It's because we are in our sinful flesh. Once we die in the resurrection, when we have new bodies, sinless bodies, and we're wearing a white robe of righteousness that was washed in the blood of Christ, we will see God. And glory to, glory to that. I know I'm not worthy of that. Believe me, I know I'm not worthy of that. I do not. I don't deserve the least of the mercies that the Lord has showed me. Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand, while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. In this body, we can't see God face to face. You'll die. So, you know, and there are words in heaven that cannot be uttered by a sinful man's flesh. It's not lawful for us to, to say those things. So, uh, something just came to mind. Let me take a look at something. In Revelation chapter 10 and verse 4, And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I, John, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. So John was 
heard something and he was told, no, don't write that down. So do you know that John that wrote the book of Revelation, do you know he was the only apostle that didn't die for the faith? Well, excluding Judas, as scary as that is. Do you know that every single one of them died for their faith? Yeah. Think about it. Wow. All right, let's keep going here. I hope the electric keeps uh, running. Um, it's about six o'clock in the evening. And uh, yeah, storm is uh, still hasn't hit land yet, so we should we should be good until a couple hours. All right, let's get going here. All right, so Exodus fifteen three. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Now, in Numbers chapter 1 and verse 3, we are told the requirements for being a soldier in the army of the Lord in the Old Testament. From 20 years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel, thou and Aaron shall number them by their armies. Armies. Women were not to go to war. It was to be males 20 years old and upward. So where did the U.S. Army get off drafting 18-year-olds during the Vietnam War? You know, I uh, I only missed the Vietnam War by a year or two. If I'd have been a little bit older, I'd have probably been sent over to that mess. But the Lord, I guess the Lord was guiding my path. Well, I don't have to guess. I know. I didn't deserve it. You know, I could look back at my life and all the different things, and the Lord was preparing me for what I'm doing now. I may not be, well, I'm positive I'm not doing perfectly what he wants, but yeah, maybe a little bit what he wants, so. In Jeremiah 15, 20, speaking of Israel, the Lord says through Jeremiah, Thou art my battle axe. You know, the Vikings loved the battle axe. The sword was faster, but the battle axe was more powerful. You will have a very tough time stopping a battle axe with a sword, uh, trying to block it. Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. God is talking to Israel here. Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war, for with thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms. That word nations there is the same word as Gentiles. Sometimes the word was translated as nations, sometimes it was translated as Gentiles. Same word. You got to read the context. People will say, oh, well, the King James trans mistranslated it wrong. No, I don't think so. When you take a shovel and dig into God's word and look at the context, you'll learn something. Every time I go through the Bible, I learn something. And if you want my uh, all my work and on a USB drive, if you're in the USA, send it to me. I'll send it back to you. I've even got the complete King James Bible on audio on that drive. You can listen to it in your car or truck on the way to work every day or whatever you go to do. And you would be amazed how much you will learn how quickly. So, in Exodus 17, 16, the Lord says, For he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war, war, W-A-R, with Amalek,
from generation to generation. How long is that? Forever. Uh, who is Amalek? Amalek was a grandson of Esau. When Israel came out of Egypt and wanted to pass through the land of Esau, Mount Seir, Edom, Edom said no. What did Amalek do? He grabbed all his people and he attacked Israel. God says, I'm going to have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And if you don't know the sin of Esau, Edom, and why God hated him, and yes, the Bible plainly declares that God hated Esau. And if you don't know why, I've got a Bible study on it. Leave a comment. I hope I see it. Tube's been real crazy lately. So, uh, first of all, Esau despised God's blessing, the, fir the, the firstborn. But secondly, he married Hittites, who were Canaanites, who were... I am positive we're fathered by the fallen angels, which people will say, oh, that's not true. That's not true. No, in Genesis 6, they want you to think that godly men married ungodly women, and then they had giants for children. And then God destroyed the earth in a flood because godly men married those ungodly women who produced giants. Yeah, I don't think so. I got an entire playlist on the angels that sinned, the sons of God. And if you don't know who, don't know who the jo uh, sons of God are, all you got to do is read Job 38 and read where the sons of God shouted for joy at the creation of the earth, the foundation of the earth. Adam didn't exist until six days later. So it was impossible. Adam didn't even exist yet. He couldn't have shouted for joy. So the sons of God cannot be Adamites. They can't be. It's impossible. But people won't read their Bibles. That's why I say they've traded the sword of the Lord for a butter knife or a spoon, actually, because they're feeding them a line of crap. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon. The Bible declares he was the wisest man that ever lived, up to that time anyways, at least up to that time. Solomon had the uh, same weakness I did. Women corrupted him. So, yeah, I like women, but I'm uh, glad I'm not a crazy 20-year-old anymore. So, yeah, I'm almost 70. I, I don't, you know, the body feels like it, but the mind doesn't, at least not yet. So, and uh, no, I'm not sending secret messages to anybody to be their lover. I got more important things to be concerned about. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Verse 1, oh, this is a beautiful, this is beautiful. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep 
and a time to cast away. A time to rend. Rend means tear or rip. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. And verse 8. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war, a time of war, and a time of peace. All right, so I said that uh, the Israel was to be God's armies on the earth. Let's prove that. You know, one thing you listen to me, I don't try to make crazy statements and then not prove them. Even though most people think I'm nuts because, well, I've been going to church for 30 years and I've never heard that chaplain, Bob. Well, of course not. Who owns the mortgage on the church building you attend? Is it paid off? Are they a business under IRS approval? 501c3? Were there a business that's tax exempt? A creation of the state? Are they? You know, the church is not a building. We are the church. And we're supposed to be God's army on the earth. Supposed to be. Exodus 6.26 these are that Aaron and Moses, to whom the Lord said, Bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their armies. Now remember, women and children are not part of this army. Only males from 20 years old and upward. Think about it. That's why it says the children of Israel according to their armies. Exodus 7, 4. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you. He's not going to listen, right? That I, the Lord, may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt, by great judgments. Now, let me tell you something. The judgments of Egypt, every single one of those judgments was a God mocking the gods of Egypt. There was a frog god in Egypt. Well, that was the plague of frogs. There was a, the god of the flies, Beelzebub, when God sent the, uh, the flies. Uh, when the, the Nile River and all the water turned to blood, there was a god of the Nile. I think it was a crocodile-headed man, I think. I don't know. I, You know, I haven't studied this stuff in so long. But the thing is, I did a Bible study. It's on a playlist, on tube, contrasting and comparing the plagues of Egypt with the plagues on the earth in Revelation. There's some very similarities there like the, uh, the great hail. There was hail in Egypt, and there's going to be hail uh, coming down in the time of the tribulation period, in Revelation, when it eventually happens. Uh, let's see. Let's keep going here. All right. You know, I've been doing this for... Oh, I don't know, 10 years or so? I got 10 years of Bible studies. Well, you know who keeps deleting them. You know, every, it seems like every week, another one of my Bible studies gets deleted by a certain platform, which is why I tell you, send me a USB drive. All those are going to be on there. Everything, I believe. So... The devil from Arkansas tried to, uh, well, he kept my computer, which had all my work on it, but I believe I was able to recreate all my Bible studies. So 
thanks to a listener that sent me uh, the work that I'd sent them back. So, may the Lord judge between me and him. Exodus 12, 17. And ye, Israel, shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. Now, what was the feast of unleavened bread? Well, there was the Passover where they took a lamb without spot or blemish. They killed it and they took the blood of the lamb and put it upon the door, the doorpost. And when the angel of death passed through Egypt, if they saw the blood on the door, they passed over that house and didn't smite anybody in the house. Well, the Feast of Unleavened Bread was, I believe it was the week, the day of and a week after, where they would eat bread that had no leaven. And leavening is yeast. And leaven is always likened unto sin. So they were supposed to go through the house and get rid of all the leaven out of the house. And that was symbolic of examining your lives on a yearly basis and casting out all the sin in your life. You know, the Lord does things in symbolism. But, you know, the, the, the leaven in the house was just a symbol of the sin in our lives that he wanted us to cast out. So, you know, and I, uh, matter of fact, I did some Bible studies on, along this line too. So, Exodus 12, 17, And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought your armies, brought your armies out of the land of Egypt, Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. Verse 51, Exodus 12. And it came to pass the selfsame day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. Numbers 2 and verse 3. And on the east side, toward the rising of the sun, shall they of the standard of the camp of Judah pitch throughout their armies, pitch throughout their armies, and Nashon, the son of Abinadab, shall be captain of the children of Judah. You got captains in the army. And then you got Numbers 2 and verse 10. On the south side shall be the standard of the camp of Reuben, according to their armies. And the captain of the children of Reuben shall be Elizer, the son of Shedeur, or something like that. I don't know. I'm not real good on Old Testament names. But you can read about all the 12 tribes and their armies. So let's go to Numbers 10.28. Thus were the journeyings of the children of Israel according to their armies when they set forward. Now, evidently, the fallen angels, when they had more children after the flood, read Genesis chapter 6, it said there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and bare children, which became men of old, men of renown. I'm paraphrasing that. It's probably pretty close, though. So, what was Goliath? He was a giant. Oh, yeah. So, was David evil because he killed Goliath? Because he should have told him the love of the Lord. Oh, Goliath, God loves you. And he wants to save you. Believe in Jesus. No. David picked up a stone and a sling. Actually, he picked up five stones, if I remember correctly. And he slung the sling. And the stone hit his forehead and it sunk in. Cracked his skull. Some Christians need their skulls cracked with some of the stupid stuff that is being taught by the pulpit. And they don't, instead of saying amen, they should have said, I object. But they don't. 
Uh, all right, so. All right, this is last one. Moses 31, 6. And Moses sent them to war, a thousand of every tribe, them and Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, to the war with the holy instruments and the trumpets to blow in his hand. Let's go to Book of Psalms. King David, probably. Psalms 1834. He teacheth my hands to war, so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. Okay. Psalms 144, verse 1, a psalm of David. Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war, and my fingers to fight. Fight who? When Israel left Egypt, they went to the promised land, and they found the enemy, the children of the fallen angels, the Philistines, the giants, and the Canaanites, and the Amalekites, and the Sinites, Sinites. Yeah, there were Sinites. Some people pronounce it Sinites. I think they lived in the land, uh, in Sinai. That's why they named it Sinai. Some people call them the Sin Sinai Sin Sinites, but I call them Sinites. S I N. You know, when Israel went into the land, the Canaanites were there to fight against them, to war against them. God said, go in there and kill them all. Don't, don't uh, kill everything that breathes. I mean, really? He didn't say, go teach them about the love of Christ. No. No. If you want to read chapter 7 of Daniel, I'm only going to read verse 21 because this is going to be a long study and I I don't know how long I'm going to have electric. I beheld and the same horn. When you read the word horn in reference to a person type thing or a government, you're talking about power. I mean, does a rhino, what is a rhino's power? It's a horn. What is the power of an elephant? Their horns. Their tusk. You know, um, same thing with goats. Goats have got horns. I beheld in the same horn made war, war with the saints and prevailed against them. Now, I did Revelate, uh, Daniel chapter 7. You can read about it. You can read about it. Um, I did a little bit of commentary on Dave, uh, Daniel, the book of Daniel. Um, I consider that the hardest book in the Bible. I really do. I wish I understood it better, but I don't. All right, let's read 1 Samuel chapter 17. I was talking about King David and Goliath, right? Verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shokho, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shokho and Azekah in Ephes Damon. I don't know, something like that. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched in the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. It means they making a battle line. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them. Uh, let's see, verse 4. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. A cubit is about half a meter, or about 18 inches for those of you, you know, a foot and a half. So six cubits is about 
um, three meters or three yards. He was at least nine feet tall. What is a span? I don't know. You know, so you got to figure he's probably 10, 11, 12 foot tall. But a cubit was generally from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger, which is about 18 inches or half a meter for those of you in the EU. Verse 5. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. That's heavy, people. He was a big guy. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. I don't know if you've ever seen a, 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 a weaver that uh, how they used to make clothing. A weaver's beam is not small. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and one bearing a shield went before him. He's a big guy. He's carrying a lot of weight, which a big guy can do. Verse 8. And he, Goliath, stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, armies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me, if, if he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then ye shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. I will guarantee you when David slung that stone God's hand was upon that stone, guiding it to Goliath's skull. Or maybe not. But God made sure it, it landed perfectly. In Psalms 139, verse 22. Well, let's take a look. Psalms 139. All right, 139 and 19. Surely thou, the Lord, will slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they, the bloody men, for they speak against thee, the Lord, wickedly. For the wicked men speak against the Lord wickedly. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. Do you hate those that hate the Lord Jesus Christ? I do. Do you love and bless those that hate and curse Jesus Christ? Like the uh, some of the denominations do? They might be cursed. I don't know. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Those that hate the Lord, I count them also as mine enemies. Verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. All right, so are we supposed to love the enemies of the Lord? Well, what did Jesus say? Well, in Matthew 5 and verse 43. Jesus said, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. 
But Jesus says to love our enemies. Love our enemies. We're not to love the enemies of the Lord. You know, uh, I've heard it said, you know, friends come and friends go, but enemies accumulate. I've made a lot of enemies in this world. Uh, some my fault. Some were not my fault. Some because they hate the Lord Jesus Christ, which I haven't been doing much for lately because I've been working. But we're to love our enemies. We're not to love the Lord's enemies. There's a difference there. I hope you see this. Now, when we are in gross sin, like the Western world is, Europe, Europe and the United States, and Canada, and, you know, we could draw a parallel with Joshua and Judges and a few other things. So let's take a look at Joshua 7.12. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I, the Lord, neither will I be with you anymore, except ye destroyed the accursed, accursed from among you. God wanted us to destroy the wicked from among us. There was a time we did this. Do you know that a century ago, murderers, they put them to death. They didn't put them in prison for the rest of their lives or put them in a mental institution and give them drugs and then say, oh, well, he's been rehabilitated by a psychiatrist and we're going to release him now. And then he goes and kills again. Nope. They didn't do that. They said, let's kill him and let God sort them out. Judges 2.14 And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies. Israel has enemies. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. In Luke chapter 20 and verse 43, we're going to read something very interesting. In Luke chapter 20, okay, um, verse 41. And he, Jesus, said unto them, How say they that Christ is David's son? And David himself saith in the book of Psalms, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore calleth him Lord, how is he then his son? Because he's Christ. That's why. All right, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians 15.25. And I'm going to let you know a little secret. You cannot take somebody else's mail. For example, Paul writing to Christians in Corinth, Corinthians, and apply it to the whole world. You can't do that. It doesn't work like that. If Paul wanted to go to China or Mongolia or Japan, the Lord would have sent him, but he didn't. First Corinthians 15.25 For he, Christ, must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Luke 19.27 Jesus, But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, R-E-I-G-N, reign, as in ruling and reigning, not water falling from the sky. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, Bring hither and slay them before me. Boy, I'll tell you what, you'll never hear that in a universalist so-called church. 
bring those enemies over here and slay them before me. Kill them. Wow. But Luke 6.27, Jesus speaking to the people, has said, But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies. Your enemies, not God's enemies. Your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. So even though we got enemies, we're supposed to, you know, do good to them. But not the Lord's enemies. There's a difference. 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 29, And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they had heard that the Lord fought against the enemies of Israel. Psalm 68, verse 1, Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. God's enemies, let them be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. Wow. 2 Kings 17.39 But the Lord your God ye shall fear, and he shall deliver you out of the hand of all your enemies. Now your enemies might kill your body, but they can't kill your soul and spirit. They can't do it. God doesn't care about your, our sinful flesh much. In Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Luke 12, 4, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. Oh, I found a beautiful verse. Psalms 116 and verse 15. Precious, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Wow. Uh, that'll preach. i tell you what. Um, I used to be a volunteer chaplain at the South Florida VA Cemetery. And... Uh, I actually had somebody, I think it was a woman, ask me to say, a, you know, some words at a, uh, a memorial before they interned the body. And when I got done, she said, oh, you, you were too preachy. I'm like, you hire a chaplain that believes the Bible and... You know, I'm preaching a salvation message of those in Christ. You know, not everybody goes to heaven. Only those that are in Christ. You know, it's too late for him. He's gone. Wherever he's going, his ticket is punched. But those that remain behind, there's still hope for them that are of the Lord's flock. So... All right, so, um, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 39. We're going to read part of the chapter. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. If I wet my glittering sword and my hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance, vengeance to mine enemies and will reward them that hate me. And this is the Lord speaking through Moses, I think. And I will make mine arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh, and that with the blood of the slain and of the captives, from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his, of his servants. God will one day avenge the blood of his servants, 
and will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. Are you God's people? I hope so. Isaiah 42, 13. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. You ever heard a lion roar? He shall prevail against his enemies. He's going to roar. The lion of the tribe of Judah is going to roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. Well, that's the Bob translation anyway. So. In Joshua 23, verse 1, And it came to pass a long time after that, that the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about, that Joshua waxed old and stricken in age. Hmm. Genesis 49, verse 8. Judah, one of the 12 tribes. This is the tribe of the kings. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. You know, the only group of people that fulfill this is the German people. Do you know that almost all the royalty of England, uh, of Europe, including England, were Germans? Yeah. Almost all of them. Did you know that during World War I, the king of Russia, the Kaiser uh, of Germany, the Tsar of Russia, and the king of England were all cousins? Did you know that? Yeah. The king of Germany, the king of Russia, and the king of England were all cousins. And they're all tricked into fighting each other like fools. Um, now, concerning our private enemies, our personal enemies, Romans 12.20, Paul writes, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, for in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Yep, we should try to win our enemies. You know, even our enemies, we should try to win to Christ. I was, I acted like one of the Lord's enemies. But um, thank the Lord that a couple in a doctor's office with me, witness to me. And I didn't want to hear it. I was talking to them about the coming one world government. And they're like, oh yeah, that's in the Bible. I rolled my eyes and I'm thinking, oh no, not Bible thumpers. But you know, everything they said made sense. Yeah. And uh, went to a hotel room that night and got out the Gideon's King James Bible and looked up all the verses that they gave me to look up. And the Lord convicted me. And, uh, yeah, I'll tell you what. If there's no repentance, there's probably no salvation. That's my opinion anyways. So. James chapter 4 and verse 4. Ye adulterers, and that was me. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? What is enmity? That's one of them fancy English words of the King's English that means extreme hatred. Enmity, extreme hatred. Friendship of the world is enemy with God. Enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Deuteronomy 33, 27. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, Destroy them. 
In Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, Behold, speaking to the apostles, I give unto you the power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And he's not talking about their flesh body because they all, 11 out of the 12 apostles died for their faith and Paul. Acts 13.10, Paul said, and, and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Wow. Numbers 10.35, And it came to pass, when the ark set forward, that Moses said, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. Now, our personal enemies, Matthew 5.44, Jesus said, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. I guess I should pray for that guy in Arkansas that lied about me and cheated me out of much of my stuff. Romans eleven twenty eight, As concerning the gospel, they, the you-know-whos, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. You see, the remnant of Judah make the mistake of following the enemies of the Lord. Just like churchgoers follow the enemies of the Lord in the so-called church world. If you want to see the enemies of the Lord, just turn on TBN. Oh, yeah. Or the 700 Prophets of Baal Club. Oh, boy. Second Chronicles chapter 6. Here we go. Boy, this is a powerful chapter. When the heaven is shut up, and there is no rain, because they have sinned against thee, yet if they pray toward this place, and confess thy name, and turn from their sin, people without repentance, there is no, you got nothing. I've been... I've seen church bulletins in restaurants, like in Texas, and they say, oh, please pray for rain. But if there's no repentance, your prayers go unanswered, my opinion, anyways. Yet if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin when thou dost afflict them, then hear thou from heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel when thou hast taught them the good way wherein they should walk and send rain upon thy land, which thou hast given unto thy people for an inheritance. If there be dearth in the land, if there be pestilence, if there be blasting or mildew, locusts or caterpillars, if their enemies, if their enemies besiege them in their cities of their land, whatsoever sore or whatsoever sickness there be, then what prayer or what supplication soever shall be made of any man or of all thy people Israel, when every one shall know his own sore and his own grief, and shall spread forth his hands in this house. Then hear thou from heaven thy dwelling place, and forgive. Lord, forgive, and render unto every man according unto all his ways, whose heart thou knowest. For thou only knowest the hearts of the children of men. Boy, that's scary. God knows our hearts. Psalms 37 and verse 20. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke. They shall consume away. See, the first time the Lord destroyed the earth in a flood of water. Next time it's going to be fire. And I did a playlist on that. Isaiah 42 and verse 3. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. 
He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. I thought that was worth bearing repeating. Um, Revelation 12, 17. Here's something to come. And the dragon, the Bible records that the dragon is the old serpent called the devil and Satan. And the dragon was wroth. He was angry. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war. Went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The devil doesn't care if you keep the commandments of God. If you don't have the testimony of Jesus, you're in big trouble. And I'm not talking about the Ten Commandments. I'm talking about the Two Commandments. Jesus said, love, thy, love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might, and love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And I'm paraphrasing, but I hope you get the idea. All right. Uh, let's see. Revelation 17, 14. These, the enemy... These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Are you called? Are you chosen? Are you faithful? I pray that I am. I pray that I am. Revelation 19.11. We're getting close to the end here. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness, righteousness, he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And the sword is the word of God, people. It's not a, you know, you look at the stupid Jehovah's Witnesses having depicting this in a picture, and it shows a sword coming out of Christ's mouth. Uh, no, this is a figure of speech, okay? And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath, wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying, To all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together into the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. See, the armies of the earth are going to fight against Christ and his armies. But it's going to be a short battle, I'm pretty sure. Verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet. Now the beast is just another name for the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. Same entity. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. And I believe this false prophet's going to dare to call himself Elijah. And I'm pretty sure one of the two witnesses that are confronting the false prophet and the beast, one of them is going to be Elijah. I'm almost positive. 99.9% .9 sure. I did a video on that. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, which wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them 
that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. You know, when you read the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah is like a mini Bible in and of itself. So let's go to chapter 2, verse 1. The word that Isaiah, Isaiah the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations, nations of Israel, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, God's law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nations, neither shall they learn war anymore. The house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. And Jesus is that light of the Lord. And if you uh, want to know more, may I suggest you look up the chapter 12 of the book of Revelation, Revealed. I did a study on Revelation chapter 12. So, there was a war in heaven. So, Yep, there's going to be a war in heaven, people. And uh, there was a war in heaven. And now this war is on earth. And uh, the Lord is going to be victorious. But until that day, until the Lord returns with his armies to reclaim his kingdom, we got to suffer in this world. So, please pray for Charles, Susan, and myself for this hurricane, Milton, and uh, all those that are on the believers on the west coast of Florida. Well, not just the west coast, but God is sending a wake-up call to his people, but they're not listening. So... If my people, which are called by my name, shall turn from their wicked ways. Oh, yeah. And let's close with 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, my people, which are called by my name, Christians, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.